like this. So you've got to be able to fix it. Um, but anyways, we went through this already, so let me... <coughs> Here is the classical Cassegrain. To get a 32-inch F6, you'd have a 44% obstruction. Mm -hmm. All right? Here it's only a less, just under a 25% obstruction. So consequently, the planets are better, the resolution is better. All spherical, tall, I already talked about that. And, and you don't need to put an elaborate baffle system. That one uh, spot that everything has to go through, as I said, you can shine a flashlight in the scope and it doesn't matter, which is absolutely amazing. I still don't, it's like magic. <laughs> uh, I won't spend too much time on this except to say that I can go from, uh, all the way from infrared to uh, out to the uh, near violet and it's staying within, uh, this is a tenth wave from here to here. So the color is fine. Here's the spot diagram. And what is the spot diagram? Spot diagram is uh, the computer analysis of the ray tracing as to what you would see for a perfect point, meaning a star. Mm -hmm. Okay, so on axis, Newtonian, uh, a Cassegrain, this will look like a spot. Mm -hmm. To put this in perspective, I'm way out here now at 12 millimeter radius. Uh, Cassegrain here is about this big. And a Newtonian looks like a big coma like that. Mm -hmm. Way out here, even though it looks like it's blowing up, which is the edge of my field, the Cassegrain is about this big, and the Newtonian is as big as the as big as this. So you all see <coughs> big coma at the edge of your field when you use a wide field. You don't see that with this scope at all. That's one of the things that they decide maybe this is worth building. <coughs> um, RMF curve in the uh, diffraction limited up to 10 millimeters across goes over the diffraction limit at the very edge, but compared to a Cassegrain and compared to a Newtonian, it's much improved. At what point were you sure it was really going to work? When I finally looked through it. <laughs> <laughs> I had a backup 20, I had a backup 32 inch, just in case. <laughs> Here's the lateral color, again that's in the Okay. Here's the field curvature. Here's the MTF curve for this scope. Now let me show you comparisons. This is a Richie Cradian, which is the only scope that comes close. They're fairly close. A Richie Cradian and this scope are about the same if you go back and forth. See? But a Richie Cradian has a 45% obstruction. This has a 25% obstruction, so this actually beats it. Here is your Cassegrain, here is your Newtonian, and here is your Siegel Relay. What is MTF stand for? Uh, the transfer function. It took me a year to understand it, and it'll take me a full hour to explain it, so I'm not even going to try. But it's the ability to resolve through a telescope. And that's really what you want, if you think about it. It's not so much being how telescopes gather light and to look at things, but how do you measure that? What you really want to know is, what two points can you resolve? And that's what this is a measure of. In different colors. Okay. So if you look at the main colors up here, okay. on, let me go back. The main colors up here, I mean, it's almost perfect all the way out. This is uh, way off from the blue, but not much different than the, uh, the uh, Richie Gradient. So does that mean you see a blue halo no, around? No, don't see it. It's still better than all these. Okay. Here's uh, on axis 6 millimeter and 12 millimeter, and your uh, MTF uh, curves. So you see the Richie Cradian is pretty good, and that's why it's a standard for all gigantic telescopes. Now, there are many professional scopes that are not Richie Cradians. I'd say that's a standard design these days, right? Yeah. And that's why. It's an excellent scope, but you have a huge central obstruction. I'm calling it the Milligan. Okay, actually beats it on axis, about the same here, and slightly less out here. But it beats the Newtonian, beats the Cassegrain. Look at the Cassegrain right here. This is what you're looking for. Okay. So now, I needed a big piece of glass. For the first 32 inch I built, uh, everyone knows Mike Matty. He, uh, I had built the 16, and then uh, someone brought a 22-inch up uh, 
the cellophane and I had aperture envy, so I wanted to go with 24 of these beta. And uh, Mike brought me a 32. <laughs> <laughs> that was left over, so that's why I built my first one. This one, it needed to be very rigid <coughs> to make this design work, so I actually had to have this cast. And here it is the mold. Uh, Peter Wagnus, who worked for Rod, everyone knows Roger Angel at, uh, in Arizona. Mm -hmm. He runs the mirror lab for uh, University of Arizona. That's where they are. Oh. It's 8.4 meters. Well, Wagnus works for him and was a lab technician of buildings. He started his own company, and this is his first one, mm -hmm. uh, which he passed to me. So here's his mold, and here's the glass that came from it. <coughs> so it's four and a half inches thick in the center. Uh, cut weight, it's thinner at the edge, but all the uh, holding will be in the center. The theory initially was this would only be held by a center post. When we actually tested it, it had a third wave deflection, which made it intolerable. We just about lost our hair over that, but we came up with a solution. Um, so here's Mike Maddy and myself making the, the uh, tool, made out of cat, plastic cast, and then we're putting the glass on the uh, tool. I had to make some parts so we can machine it. And here's the mirror being lifted into place. The first grind. Is hmm? this Pyrex or what material? The, this is Pyrex. All the others are either BK or there's some, several other glasses. Uh, but this is Pyrex cast mm -hmm. and uh, standard type. Uh, the let me just, the uh, mold that was used for that glass. Yeah. Was this removed by, was this the stuff you removed by water? I don't know how he did it. He uh, machines out this. Okay. It's, it's a computer the design mold. They use a, a mold which then is removed with high velocity water. Yes, it, that, the back end it's removed that way, okay. but it's uh, it's machined by some uh, computer design. Okay. And, and basically, I, I saw a video of the machine, the computer just kind of does this thing <laughs> and it makes it, and it took, so it takes about a day to make the mold. So anyways, here is uh, the initial polish, the pads, and you check and wedge. Here we are with the uh, full lap, pressing, polishing, and the mirror is it's being tested, the big uh, flip table. And so we look through it, this looked good, <laughs> and this one, I said, oh no. It looked like a turned edge, right? It turns out it wasn't because as we rotated it, it always had a, in the gravity vector. Turns out after what we ended up doing is I went to my friend George East. I think you all know George. He's a very bright guy. He spent the time, him and uh, Scott spent the time, it took about a month, and we, he did a 10,000 element analysis on the mirror and recreated this simply by gravity. Turns out the mirror this is sort of like the Hubble story, right? The mirror was ground to 16th wave, but it had a third wave deflection. So it's not 16th wave. So what do you do? Well, oh, okay, I'll get to how we fixed it. <laughs> but that was that was a little bit of a problem, but we finally managed. So the M1 had, was great and expected. Um, so we had to redesign the mount, basically. So we had to make an 18-point cell in addition to the center post. The original design was to be the center post. See, Scott wanted to had designed a 24-inch, and I said, I don't deal with small telescopes. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted a 36, and so he had a 32. We fought and fought and fought, finally compromised on a 32. And uh, the problem was, things don't scale up right. <laughs> so here it is, the uh, finite element analysis, and this was the deflections, which mimicked it exactly, which is good. Because if you can model something, then you know how to fix it, because then you can play with it. So it played with it quite a bit, tried different uh, places to attach it, which is not so clear cut because it's it's not a standard piece of glass. It has a conical shape. Turned out the points had to be put full way in. But anyways, after a lot of playing and analysis, um, came up with a design that worked. Here was the initial, 